I think that there's awesome benefits. I don't have any hours that I have to work. I don't have anywhere that any commute that I have to deal with. I can take a day off whenever I want. I can go to the museum instead of painting and it's still sort of productive as long as I don't have like a deadline, a show coming up that I have to have a number of pieces for. So there's definitely like a romantic lifestyle aspect of it that is really appealing and flexible and awesome. You're getting something for your risk there as an artist. You're getting this awesome fantasy lifestyle in trade for maybe the, the risk of lean time. All right, Pencil Kings, today we're talking to Jane Radstrom. And before we get into anything, I just want to give you the URL where you can get the show notes and anything that we talk about, and that'll be at pencilkings.com slash Jane Radstrom. So that'll be J-A-N-E dash R-A-D-S-T-R-O-M. Jane is a fine artist. This is really cool because we haven't had that many fine artists on the podcast. And so I'm interested to hear how she got started and how to make sense of this world because you know, I, I know so little about it. So welcome to the call, Jane. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm great, Mitch. How are you? I'm good. But before we dive into the questions that I really want to ask, what's it like being a fine artist? I went to, you know, the School of Fine Art in uh, Winnipeg, Canada, and I never saw myself as being a fine artist. I always knew I was going to be a commercial artist working on films or video games or comic books or something like that. But is this something that you always knew that you wanted to do, be being a fine artist? You know, I think I did latch onto it early on. Um, when I was a kid, I was playing video games and I thought maybe I wanted to be a concept artist. And then I went to an atelier. Uh, because in the concept art community, I don't know if people remember an old school board called conceptart.org. I was involved in that. And in that community, it was like really well known that you needed to get the basics down in order to go into that world. So you needed to get real traditional training. So I went to an atelier, which is a Renaissance style school for life drawing and painting, very classical kind of education, working from live models. Um, and at that atelier, I kind of realized that I was way more into the fine art aspect of it and that that was going to be my path. So afterwards, I went to college and um, continued down that path. And what was it about fine art that, that grabbed you more than the concept art that you thought you wanted to do? Um, I think that it was just that I love working from observation and I'm not so good at like space marines or dragons. <laughs> it's a, um, the kind of fantastical element of it isn't as appealing to me as just moving paint around, color, design, working directly from observation. Definitely makes sense to me. So you get out of the atelier and then you go into school and then bam, you're a fine artist, everything is great, right? Or, <laughs> or was the path a little bit different than that? Well, I actually, in school, I went to Ringling in Sarasota, uh -huh. and I majored in illustration because uh, their illustration program was, again, really traditionally grounded, really kind of realism-based with lots of life drawing. And so I thought that, you know, this would give me some kind of career options to be able to make my way... Um, before I could make the fine art thing work out. And that was the case because for the first couple of years, I did a lot of freelance. I did freelance like graphic design um, and illustration and branding, which was my favorite aspect of freelance. And then a few years in, I decided to kind of narrow down my focus and really commit to the fine art um, and get the other things off my website and no longer advertise for them so that I could appear a little more serious and committed in the fine art world. I've only ever met one person who was very seriously going down the fine art road. And then at one point she said, you know, I'm not going to do it anymore. It was really all about attending these gallery openings and schmoozing with people that I wasn't that interested in talking with. And hearing her experience, I was kind of just... It's not that it left a bad taste in my mouth, but something like that, you know, it's just like, oh man, it's so difficult to be a fine artist. All you want to do is make your art, but then maybe that's only 20% of it. And the other 80% is getting out there and promoting yourself. That doesn't sound so appealing, but I don't know if that's actually based in reality because I only have one person that I've talked to. <laughs> 
Well, I think that there's a few different paths that people take. Um, I have some friends in fine art who do a lot of their own promotion and they've kept their agreements very open with any galleries so that they're allowed to sell work themselves. They're allowed to make prints and do whatever they want. Um, usually the type of galleries that you can have that kind of agreement with are doing like curated group shows, maybe solo shows, but they're not really um, representing artists full time. So they just accept a specific painting to their gallery for a specific show. And if it doesn't sell, they give it back to you and you can do whatever you want the rest of the time. Uh, there's a benefit to that because if you're really aggressive in promoting yourself, which I have a few friends who are, then you can really do well with prints or selling work on your own outside of the galleries and use those gallery shows for the kind of prestige and the additional audience that they can bring in. But mostly you're just hustling yourself. Um, that's not really what I wanted to do. The thing that I'll say about that career path is that it's probably you can make a little bit more money at it right away, but it's really hard to transition from there to being like a mid-career artist that sells their work for thousands of dollars and shows all over the country or all over the world. It's kind of hard to make that tr transition. Usually it's really kind of associated with juxtapose and high fructose and like the kind of it's called this is not what i'm calling it this is what it's called it's called the lowbrow art scene the art that's in all those magazines and stuff and it's like it's just different so what i chose to do was look for galleries that would represent me permanently so they have exclusive rights to sell my work in their region and they always have some of my work in the gallery um, they always have a piece on display even if it's not my show at that time. They always have my work on their website. And whenever I do new pieces, I kind of send it to those galleries and they say like, yeah, we'll take this one. Or, you know, I have to kind of manage which work is going where, but they're always willing to accept the new work that I'm taking, even when there's not a specific show planned for it. And that is a little bit more like an art rep or an agent where they're supposed to be acting on your behalf and doing the sales part for you all the time. And then you're a little bit more limited in what you can do yourself because you have to be really careful with those relationships and managing uh, that aspect. So you can't just go and sell work for any price you want. You have to maintain the retail price. And uh, if you're going to do prints or something, you really have to like talk it through with the galleries to make sure that everybody's on board. It's a, you know, it's a little bit more um, controlled kind of career. But from my understanding, it's the path that leads to um, ultimately being like a museum artist, just kind of going as far as you could go in the fine art world. That makes perfect sense. Probably a lot closer to the dream of being able to spend 80% of your time on making your art and then 20% of your time on everything else. Instead of those group shows that you're talking about, that sounds like a lot of hustle, a lot of social media, a lot of putting up flyers or, you know, whatever you do to get the word out, you, you got to be uh, moving all the time. Yeah, it it's a little closer, although it's surprising to me the number of things that there still are to do. I still try to maintain a good social media presence because I want to attract as much audience as possible. So I maybe I don't hit it as hard as people who are relying on it for a living, but I'm active. And then framing and shipping take up a lot of time, just kind of bringing things back and forth from the framer, coordinating, building crates, doing interviews. <laughs> there's, always, <laughs> there's always like other things other than making art that I wish it was 80, 20, but maybe it's 60, 40. Maybe I could protect my painting time better and, and get it to 80, 20 though. What, what is it? I'm sorry to bother you. 
so from the standpoint of the beginner, somebody that wanted to go down this path to eventually be represented by galleries, can you start there? Or is there sort of like a prerequisite to kind of open that door in the first place? Well, I think that one of the big prerequisites is that galleries, when they're going to represent an artist, they want to see a history of producing work at a certain quality and with thematic ties. So basically, they want to see that you have a body of work or several connected bodies of work that they're interested in. Because if you send just one good piece to a juried show, then they can accept that one piece and they're not worried about the next piece you do or the last five. But if the gallery is going to have this relationship with you, they want to know that the things you produce and put out there are all, you know, something that they want to represent. So you have to work, I think, in a more cohesive way and you have to have developed a number of pieces. Maybe the minimum would be 12 to start applying to kind of emerging artist galleries that might represent you. And as you build your career, then you want to have large bodies of work that people would say, oh, yeah, that's Jane Radstrom. Basically working in a theme and working in series. I have a really large body now of these pastel paintings of people, and they're very um, iconic because they're just a person on white. Sometimes there's a chair or a stool, but there's no other background elements in the painting. And I started off with just a single figure, but I've been um, kind of evolving that into uh, overlaying multiple poses into one image. So that is all recognizable. I think that when you see one of those, you you can definitely say, yeah, that's Jane Radstrom. That comes down to like kind of style or voice also. And, uh, and I've got tons of them. A gallery I just submitted to recently wanted a minimum of 30 pieces produced in the last two years to show as one body of work in order to just submit and say like, hey, this is me. This is what I've done. For those listening, I encourage you to go to Jane's website, janeradstrom.com or penselkings.com slash janeradstrom and check out some of the examples of the work that she's talking about. They're absolutely beautiful. Thank you. I'm looking at the picture of of you right now with the two girls kneeling on the chair, whispering kind of a butterfly or a mirrored image. And then there's another one behind, but really great work. And there's artwork that you're like, you can appreciate it, but you'd never want to have it in your home. I think this is artwork that would really fit well in probably like any home. Very nice and clean, at least for my style, my (laughs) taste. I I really like it. For some people, it's kind of edgy because I do a lot of girls dressing and undressing and I am very careful to curate the images so that they are what I believe is tasteful. But um, it's interesting, like on social media, things on Facebook get to other people's walls who have never heard of me. And every so often I get a reaction where somebody's just like, what is this naked person? (laughs) And I'm surprised. And that's it? Like you're just surprised? You're like, does it actually affect you? It doesn't really bother me, but doing a mentorship after school, I went out to Kansas City um, to mentor with an old artist and illustrator, Mark English. And one of the things that he kind of had as advice for me was that nudes are really hard to sell, that that's like the most difficult thing in the fine art world. And so I should do some still lives and landscapes to get my foot in the door. So for the first couple of years, while I was freelancing, doing illustration and design, I was trying to produce like still lives and landscapes, these kind of more acceptable um, things. And I wasn't painting very many of them. I would always, you know, pick up a freelance project instead or decide to spend my time in other ways. And I also wasn't selling any of them. So I I was kind of discouraged for those first few years. And finally, I just thought, you know, if this is going to be this art thing, it's going to be like my side project on the side of illustration and design work, then I'm just going to paint whatever I want. I'm not going to worry about what will sell. And I started this girl series, which is girls dressing and undressing. I had been to a couple gallery shows in town in Austin, Texas, where I lived. And I thought, man, that work was not very good. They should put my work in those galleries. And I sent those girls out just to be like, I have them. I have a bunch of them now. I'm just going to send it. What's the worst that can happen? They're sitting in my 
room now, not doing anything at all, basically. And those got picked up and those have been what's really flown for me, what's really started my career. So it's kind of amazing. My husband likes to tell this story that I tried to sell out, but I couldn't. So I had to just do what I love. (laughs) Do you think it's a function that because you enjoyed producing these, that that just naturally comes through in the work and that it's almost like no matter what you do, when it's like hitting that the the flow state or if it's your passion, good things are going to happen from that? Yeah, I think that if you're really interested and engaged and you want to be working, then that is the best work will come out of that state. So it's hard to put yourself in a direction that you're not that into and produce something great from that. Definitely. I just want to make sure that I understand the story correctly. So you want to be a fine artist. You had some advice saying that, you know, nudes are really difficult to sell. So you should consider doing some more landscape and still lives. You were kind of doing that, but you found like other things to do basically to fill up your time because you weren't jazzed about it. And then you went to a gallery show and you said, hey, wait a second. My girls are are just as good or better than what's hanging in this gallery show. I got to take the next step and show these to somebody because I'm doing comparable or better work. And I I think I got a shot. Did I break it down correctly? Yeah. And you know, the funny thing is when I submitted that work for the first time, I sent it out to galleries. I actually had thought that about a gallery, which was kind of new in town and had like really hip shows like, Oh, my work should be here. And then because I spent all the time to update my website and design a nice resume and update, you know, all the materials I needed in order to send to them. I thought there's another gallery in town that's been here a long time. It's a really good gallery. And I already have all this material. So I'm going to send it to this gallery. I think I can get in. And then I'm going to send it to this gallery. I'd really like to be in that. I don't really think I'll get into also, you know, and I just, I already had all the materials. So I sent it to both. And the gallery that I really wanted to be in got back to me the same day. Awesome. Yeah. And the other one actually never got back to me. (laughs) The one that wasn't as good a gallery. (laughs) Luckily, that one that was my top pick in the city I lived in, uh, you know, responded so quickly. So I didn't have to keep sending it out for that area. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if somebody wanted to do this, I feel like it, we've we've laid out the steps and it's it's pretty straightforward. Like find something that, that you're passionate about, produce that work, and then start contacting people. Is there a certain framework or a way to pr- present your work? I think that in the gallery world, um, they don't like it if you stop in with your portfolio. So I would definitely say don't do that. Although if you make an appointment, it can be fine. Uh, but don't just like kind of drop by and ask for someone to look at it. Um, cause they get so many people and, and it's hard for them if it's not work they're interested in to cut, you know, that's a difficult position to be in, to be there in person. And galleries usually post submission guidelines on their website. And unfortunately, it's kind of all over the board. Some will accept a link to your website in an email as a submission. Um, and others want you to mail them a portfolio that's printed out or on CD or something like that. So you kind of have to go and dig in uh, on the websites in order to find out how each gallery wants to receive it. And then you should respect that, whatever they say on the website. If it's a local gallery, then of course you can go and try to go to their openings, say hello to the owner, tell them your name, um, tell them that you're planning to submit and ask them to look for your submission or something like that, which can be, you know, helpful and doesn't put them on the spot in an awkward way. And I've got a follow up question. Your proximity to the thing that you want, that affects things like the closer you are really increases your chances, especially when you're starting out. But let's say you're in the middle of like nowhere, uh, Michigan, let's say I'm there and I want to show in these galleries in Austin, for whatever reason, I choose Austin as the place that I want to send my work to. Is it realistic to say like you can break in when you're that far away, like just doing things by email or sending off the CDs like you're talking? I feel like if you're an amazing talent, like you'll just have success wherever you go. But let's say you're more of like an average person, like you're talented. And yes, these are sellable pieces of artwork, but you're just so dang far. Is that going to stop you? Because 
if somebody's listening to this and they're in Michigan or they're in wherever far flung corner of the world, I don't want them to have any reason not to take the next step with this stuff. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of galleries want to show work from all over the country or the world because it makes their gallery a little more prestigious. They're bringing culture to a city from all over the place. There's a little bit more risk in it for the gallery if they're going to represent an artist from someplace else because uh, they have to ship work back and forth. It's a little bit more expensive. There's more risk in it for you too. Usually the way shipping works is that the artist pays for shipping to the gallery and the gallery pays for shipping back if they don't sell it. They hope they just sell it. You hope they just sell it. But that's the only thing galleries definitely want uh, to hear from people all over to bring that to their city. Perfect. I'm so fascinated about this because it's a form of the art world that I'm just not so familiar with. I don't have any fine art friends, you know, or, or nobody's in my immediate uh, sphere of influence. The whole idea of this starving artist myth, when you think of fine artists, you definitely think about it more than if you were, say, uh, an illustrator or something else. What do you have to say to this? Like, in your first year, is it sort of like, yep, you're going to starve in your first year unless you luck out and, and, and win the, you know, the quote unquote gallery lottery or whatever? What would you have to say from your own experience or from other people that you've seen? You know, unfortunately, I have worse news. <laughs> I thought that you struggle and then you get into a good gallery and then you get into a few more good galleries in other regions and then you can expect sales to be sort of consistent. But it's turning out that the consistency is not something you can count on. Uh, even I'm in three good galleries now, but you know, there's just ebbs and flows with the sales cycle and it helps if you've got solo shows scheduled so that they're really promoting your work, but uh, maybe you're not doing a solo show at each gallery every single year because they have more than 12 artists which most galleries do. So maybe they're scheduling them every two or three years and uh, your work isn't getting quite as much attention uh, the rest of the time or the oil market is down in Texas. So sales are slower for a year, something you can't control at all, you know? So I'm kind of thinking about ways to influence sales a little bit more, even though I'd like to just turn responsibility over entirely to the galleries. Because it's frustrating to be sitting at home and feel like, oh, these guys are, it's their job to push this stuff. And then like, oh, I didn't sell one this month. Uh oh, you know, you can't quite count on even having broken in having steady income. You have to be really prepared with good savings plans so that you can kind of ride out lean times and get to the next swell. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I know fine artists like my mentor, Mark English, his work sells for five to 50 grand per painting. And he's in five or six galleries across the country. So he's always got a, at least one, if not two solo shows a year. And I mean, he does great. He's definitely not an emerging artist. I mean, he's mid to late career and you can't just rush to that point as a young artist. I'm not sure exactly the fastest it could take you to become mid-career. I don't know, but it's going to be counted in years, definitely not like a year in or two years in. So I suppose it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Being an artist is such a romantic idea. If you can make it work, and even for myself too, like being a business owner, you, my parents have, have said to me, you know, like, why don't you just give this thing up? You had a good job before. Why are you doing this? Why are you like scraping by? I'm not saying that you're scraping by, but I'm saying that I have definitely scraped by. But I'm doing it. I'm doing the thing that I want to do. You know, I'm nobody's in control of me. And I think it's so great that I'm able to kind of design my life. But you're doing the thing that you want to do that makes you feel alive and like you're expressing yourself. Am I off base? Am, am I alone in this? No, I mean, I think that there's awesome benefits. I don't have any hours that I have to work. I don't have anywhere that any commute that I have to deal with. I can take a day off whenever I want. I can go to the museum instead of painting and it's still sort of productive as long as I don't have like a deadline, a show coming up that I have to have a number of pieces for. So there's definitely like, a romantic lifestyle 
aspect of it that is really appealing and flexible and awesome, you're getting something for your risk there as an artist. You're getting this awesome fantasy lifestyle in trade for maybe the, the risk of lean times. Definitely. Doesn't matter if we really see it and only imagine we do. We see something and it changes us. My favorite piece on your site is the girl in green. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because it's colored a little bit different, so it stands out from the other ones. But if I'm looking at this now and I wanted to buy this painting, what do I do? Do I have to actually go to the gallery in Texas to, to find this? Or um, is there a way that I could buy it online? Or h- how does that work? Almost all my work is in galleries. I have very little of it at my studio. So when people email me and they say they want a certain piece, either it's sold already or it's at a gallery. So I would send you somewhere to buy it. Unfortunately, that one got damaged in transit. And so it's just dead. That one, actually, I shipped it to a new gallery and uh, they claim they never received it. And it's gone. That's like a notch on your belt of something that's like says you've arrived. I, I try and look at these negative moments or like these mishaps along the way as like positive, um, positive markers that you're going down the right path that if you didn't, you know, the more you, you do something, the more weird, you know, things that you would never thought would happen will happen to you. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of like a rite of passage. Learning experiences. And what I would say for that one is that before you apply to galleries that you're interested in, um, write to some of the artists that they represent and ask them how the gallery is and ask for their honest opinion. Like, do they pay on time? Do they tell you when they sell a work? Do you like the way that they treat your images or whatever before applying or before sending work if they contact you. In terms of my work, you know, it's interesting to me to kind of manage this career because I try to think a lot about the themes of my work and about how they're really personal to me. So I hope that when everybody who's listening to this podcast goes to my website, maybe you're at my website right now as you're listening, looking at it. Um, when I'm shooting the pictures for these double exposure paintings, which is how I work, I hire a model and I shoot thousands of photos and I ask the model to move really slowly um, and do an action over and over again until they basically get bored and they're tired of me. So I say like, put your hair up and take your hair down, and put it up and take it down over and over. Um, And then they become really candid. And so when I look through the thousands of photos, I'm looking for the images which have this spark of personality, but they're very, very natural. It's like a micro expression on the model's face, which really feels like them. And I try to layer, in the case of the double exposures, I try to layer two of those, which are a little bit different. You know, maybe looking at the viewer and then a more internal pensive moment and try to create an, a more complete picture of the model's personality by combining uh, two of those really natural moments. It's definitely, I think, very personal work, even though I'm painting other people all the time. Uh, and it's really fun for me to be able to just pick that theme and run with it and work out all the nuances of it, kind of go in one direction, in another direction, and really play with it, all my ideas on that theme uh, for a long time. So that's kind of what that series is about in case. I hope everyone's looking at it now and can kind of see that. All right, Jane, thank you very much for giving us a glimpse inside the fine art world. Are you open to people contacting you? Yeah, I do. I get um, students writing me occasionally and I try to write back, especially if it's a concise question. It's a little harder if you say like, how do I do everything about art? But (laughs) (laughs) yeah, ask me a question that I can answer in a paragraph or two and I'll definitely write back. Well, for sure, just go to Jane's website, uh, janeradstrom.com, and check out her work. I feel like you could really help people navigate the waters. I remember being in art school, and this is one of the things that I graduated having no clue how, it, like, literally no clue how I would support myself. Oh, my God, if I wasn't hustling on my spare time and, and learning computer, I would have just been, I would not be have done anything related to art because school definitely did not prepare me. So if you're in that 
boat and you need some advice and you want to go on the fine art road, I would highly recommend um, just reaching out to Jane and, and with, with your specific questions, no general questions. <laughs> and uh, thank you once again, Jane. And the show notes from this will be at pencilkings.com slash Jane dash Radstrom. That's J-A-N-E dash R-A-D-S-T-R-O-M. Thanks a lot, Jane. Thanks, Matt. Don't demand patience, skill, years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration. Why don't you head over to PencilKings.com slash free, where we've put together a 30-day course that's going to teach you the ins and outs of drawing the face, along with homework and printable study guides that you can use wherever you are in the world.